name is Brian Dyer. I'm the uh, Senior Acquisitions Editor at Baker Academic in New Testament. Today, I'm going to be talking with Matthew Thiessen. It's Matthew, right? Yep, that's right. Okay, it's pronounced Matthew Thiessen. That's what I meant by not embarrassing myself. I can't uh -huh. help myself <laughs> sometimes. We'll edit all that out. All, all right. right. Matthew Thiessen, who's Associate Professor at Religious Studies at McMaster University, did your PhD at Duke. That's right. Yep. Right. And so we're going to be talking today about Jesus and the forces of death. I thought uh, the best kind of first question, uh, and some of this I know, but some of this I'm kind of genuinely interested in hearing about, is how you arrived at this topic. Um, your earlier work, which I have one with me, uh -huh. um, focused uh, on Paul, or at least this one exclusively on Paul. And, uh, I, you know, there's a pledge that we take when you get your New Testament PhD, that if you're going to do Paul, then you won't do Jesus. But you broke that pledge. And so my question is, uh, how did you arrive at uh, moving on to the, the topic of Jesus and the forces of death? Yeah, uh, great question. When I was writing my dissertation at Duke, uh, I was focused on circumcision and identity construction and ethnicity and was uh, reading on um, conceptions of impurity in ancient Judaism. And I really got interested in the work of Jacob Milgram and others, Christine Hayes, uh, and Jonathan Clawans. And uh, as I was reading through on ritual impurity, especially, I began to realize, wait a minute, we have these gospel stories that I've never thought about. Uh, they're about ritual impurity. Jesus and the man with lepra, often translated as leprosy, a woman with a genital hemorrhage, and corpses. And so I figured, I think there's a book to write here. So connect it to your earlier work, because I feel like there is a connection between uh, your dissertation and then uh, Paul and the Gentile problem. So kind of how does it um, present kind of just a, con not just a, but a continuation of the work that you've been doing in your publishing? Yeah, all of my work uh, is really focused on questions around, um, well, the relationship between Christianity and Judaism, early Jesus followers, and the Jewish law. So Circumcision was my first two, uh, topic of my first two books. Questions of, has Paul abandoned the law? Has he rejected it? Um, and that just flows, of course, into the question of, well, what about Jesus? And, you know, aspects of the Jewish law that we might find different or odd, like ritual impurity. What's Jesus doing now? Yeah. So one thing, I was going back over the book, and uh, I was... I was reminded of, you know, in, uh, in his endorsement, Matt Novenson said that uh, if you read the book, you'll learn a thousand new things. And I think maybe what he was referring, I don't know what he was referring to, but he, he might have been referring specifically to there's numerous places in your argument where you are correcting or um, uh, yeah, trying to refocus some misconceptions about the first century world, about what the gospel writers are doing. And so as I was working through it, I was just taking some notes. Now, of course, the main argument is you're trying to correct uh, the misconception that Jesus is rejecting the Jewish ritual purity system. Uh, but, you know, I noticed in the beginning you're talking about uh, a misconception about the relationship of the Old Testament to uh, the New Testament, but also to contemporary Christians. But then uh, categories of holy and profane and pure and impure, your discussion on Luke 2.22 about uh, Luke's understanding of childbirth and purity, uh, the misconception about lepra and leprosy, which you just referenced, and there's a couple more. But I thought I would ask you, what uh, of the topics that you discuss in this book, um, what you think is maybe the biggest misconception um, and uh, of the topics that you talk about with yeah. modern interpreters, maybe even just kind of, um, maybe not scholars, but um, uh, kind of Christianity when we talk about like leprosy or something like that. What's the biggest misconception that, that you tackled in this book, you think? Uh, you're asking me to pick my favorite child right now. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe my least favorite child. No, that, that's, um, question, that's question number eight down here. I'll, I'll get to that. <laughs> All right. My kids won't watch this anyways. Right. Um, I think, I mean, ultimately, it's just the, the larger question about the larger misconception, I think, amongst Christians, whether that's lay people uh, clergy or even scholars that that uh, the Gospels depict Jesus uh, abandoning aspects of the Jewish law like Sabbath and like ritual impurity. Um, it's very very common. Everybody argues it. Jesus was a Jew, but then we frequently go on to to hedge that 
and say, well, he was a Jew, but he also didn't like this and this and this about the Judaism of his day. And what we end up doing is just making him look like ourselves, Baptists, Anglicans, Mennonites, whatever. And uh, I really wanted to show, no, Jesus is just a Jew from his day, uh, arguing with other Jews or disagreeing with other Jews or debating with other Jews about what's the right way for us to live. Yeah. So not, not abandoning, but uh, having discussions about it. And there's a great deal of variety in ancient Judaism about uh, how the law is to be interpreted and lived. So Jesus fits within that variety. Was it within your discussion of um, the dietary laws where you were talking about how Jesus, uh, the argument he's making, I could have this wrong. The argument he's making is an argument, you know, within kind of, uh, I mean, this isn't the right phrase, but kind of within Jewish discussions or logic that would make sense within uh, just ongoing Jewish discussions. Or maybe that was somewhere else, but you kind of were making that point that, that Jesus is reasoning within a very Jewish, first century Jewish mindset. Yeah. yeah. If, if you look at the legal arguments, I mean, Jesus is making legal arguments it's, uh, or halakhic arguments, how to interpret the law over and over again in the sort of logic he uses isn't logic that ancient Jews would have said, well, that doesn't make sense. Uh, rabbis, uh, rabbinic literature, later rabbinic literature uses the same sorts of arguments. Um, how, to, how to prioritize the law is central to uh, Jewish law interpretation. At times, laws are going to come into conflict. How do you rank which law takes precedence? Um, temple trumps Sabbath in ancient Jewish thinking. Jesus makes the same argument, actually, in the Gospel of Matthew. The temple's more important than Sabbath, but humans are more important than the temple. Therefore, if people need to eat and need to pick grain to eat on the Sabbath, then they do it. Um, life is more important than uh, any other aspect of the law. And that's just a very common uh, rab later rabbinic interpretation of the law. This, the preservation of life is more important than uh, other aspects of the law, but yeah. not breaking the law. Yeah, thanks. Uh, here's another question I, I had. Um, I, so I noticed a theme as I was going back through the book. I noticed a theme that, that appears a couple of times about... Um, Jesus's power or, or um, his ability to um, cure of the source of impurity, but that happening from a distance. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the hemorrhaging woman who just touches his garment uh, without his consent uh, is healed. Um, Jesus raises the dead from a distance. Even, I think you reference in Matthew, the raising of the dead while he's on the cross. Yeah. But this, this theme of, of, him being able to do this from a distance kind of kept coming up. And I was curious, what do you think the gospel writers were trying to do or were they trying to do anything yeah. um, by that happening or is there yeah. nothing there? Um, no, I think, I think so. It, it's actually, mo you see it most with the corpse with corpses. Uh, Mark, the earliest gospel, Jesus touches the little girl and says, Talitha Kum, get up little girl. Uh, in, in Luke, we have Jesus touching just the, um, well, the, the funeral beer of the young man who's going to be buried, not the man himself, and he gets up. John, you have Lazarus, and from a distance, Jesus calls him out of the tomb. And I think what you get is the gospel writers uh, seeking to depict Jesus uh, as, as a source of power as dramatically as possible, and the fact that he can... Uh, sort of cross the distance or his power can cross the distance between him and a corpse and still raise it from the dead is further the distance, the more impressive it is. It's um, if you think about electricity, it's kind of like uh, a spark that can shoot across mm -hmm. and the stronger the charge, the further it shoots. I'm not mm -hmm. actually sure if that's true about electricity, but I'm just guessing it is. It works. It works for the yeah. analogy. Yeah. Let me ask a couple. We asked, um, uh, if anybody on social media, if they had any questions, and a couple of questions came up that I thought uh, were, were pretty good. Um, so first, um, this question uh, is, how, how does within this whole discussion of impurity, um, does, uh, they raise the question of people who are living with physical disability. Yeah. How, how does that fit within kind of the, the, the schema in the first century world? and within kind of what's going on, or, or does it not quite fit within what you were talking about? You know, if there's um, 
I'm glad the book's written and it's out. But if I were to go back and write it, I would definitely uh, work through and incorporate more on disability studies. That's a, that's a real gap there. And there are people doing work on this uh, now, which is great. Canada Moss and Isaac Soon, a PhD student at Durham and others. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky question. Uh, how to, how to talk about this. I, I don't bring up disability. Obviously, someone could look at the hemorrhaging woman and say, this is a disability, and uh, how are we to handle this given sort of modern people in our modern conceptions of disability and our modern sensibilities? And yeah, I don't claim to be an expert there. I'll leave it to those scholars to talk about that. Um, kind of related to that, uh, another question came up of how did the purity laws relate to Gentiles. Um, and then a kind of a extension of that that I would add is maybe contemporary application where what is this, what does this all mean um, for Christians? Oh. So ritual impurity, Jewish ritual impurity has to do specifically with the temple or tabernacle before that and access to holy space and access to food that's been sacrificed, offered in the holy space that you can eat. Gentiles can't go into the temple. Uh, in Herod's temple, they can get out to the outer courts, but that's not uh, the temple proper. Um, and they can't access the food. So uh, scholars like Christine Hayes and Jonathan Clowans have argued, I think very, very um, convincingly that ritual impurity, Jewish ritual impurity doesn't apply to Gentiles. Gentiles aren't considered ritually impure. Uh, contrary to a lot of New Testament scholarship and a lot of the way people think. Now, there were lots of Gentiles out there. In fact, I think all Gentiles out there, uh, their own religious traditions had conceptions of ritual impurity, especially to the corpses and uh, sex. Uh, certain temple cults wouldn't allow you to go in. So in that sense, the whole world believed in ritual impurity, but it's, it was cult specific and Jews thought our conceptions of ritual impurity just don't apply to Gentiles. So when you come to think about Christianity today, predominantly, not exclusively Gentile, um, these things, you know, if, if people are sitting out there thinking, wait a minute, this book is true and Jesus cares about ritual impurity, do I now need to care about ritual impurity? The answer is uh, no, that's, I mean, A, the Jerusalem temple is not standing, and B, if you're a Gentile, it, that wouldn't matter anyways. Um, but what I think the book one of the sort of contemporary applications of the book is to think about Jesus's mission as uh, deeply concerned about purification. And purification has to do with the removal, of course, of impurities. And if Jacob Milgram's right, impurities represent death, thus the title of the book, The Forces of Death. Uh, Jesus's mission from start to end is all about the destruction, the ultimate defeat of death. And so for followers of Jesus today, thinking about ways in which one associates with life uh, and fights against the forces of death in our world, and there are plenty as we see regularly in the news and social media, um, I think that's the way we enter into the story of Jesus. Yeah, thanks. So my last question is what you're working on now. So uh, this book has come out. Uh, what's kind of the next thing on your radar yeah. as far as research and writing? Yeah, I am... Uh, well, two things, but the, the, the most uh, immediate thing is I'm trying to, trying to write a smaller book on Paul, more popular level book on Paul from what's often called the Radical New Perspective, or more recently, the Paul Within Judaism perspective that uh, seeks to make uh, a little more accessible some of these uh, arguments that scholars like Paula Fredrickson, Mark Manos, myself, and others have made so that um, lay people, interested clergy who maybe don't have uh, you know, time to wade through thousands of pages of scholarship might be interested in seeing how that could be helpful for them. Great. Sorry, that, that's the first one. The second one is a larger, a larger book uh, from Genesis to Revelation uh, and, and uh, thinking of ways of reading it that are, again, ultimately about uh, life giving and reading about the God of life in, in the pages of the Bible. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Matt. Uh, I don't know how to close this. They didn't tell me how to close it. So I'll hold the book up All and right. I'll thank you. And uh, then the credits will begin to roll. Beautiful. So, thanks for having me. Yeah.